I'll be presenting to you this paper on mental health and criminal involvement, evidence from losing Medicaid eligibility. And the motivation behind this paper is the high prevalence of mental illness in today's criminal justice population. So to illustrate this prevalence, I'm just showing you fig uh, here a figure that I made with my primary data source. I'll tell you a bit more about the data later on, but I simply wanna show you the likelihood of incarceration for individuals with and without mental health histories at a given age. So here the blue line shows you the likelihood of incarceration for individuals who received a mental health diagnosis prior to age 17. And the orange line shows you the same probability for those that never received a diagnosis. So you see that by age 24, individuals with mental illness, diagnosed mental illness, they're three times more likely to have been incarcerated than those without a diagnosis. And this very strong correlation between mental illness and criminal involvement is not just present in my data, but it's well established in other data sources as well. And from a public finance perspective, uh, individuals with mental illness tend to have uh, longer prison sentences, higher recidivism rates, and more expensive medical needs. So they're a very high cost population within an already expensive criminal justice system. So this correlation uh, begs the question of whether it will tend to persist, whether this uh, high correlation will always happen or whether improving access to health services could potentially be one way to reduce these individuals contact with the criminal justice system. And that's exactly what I study in this paper. Um, the way that I go about studying this question is by using administrative data from South Carolina that links individual level records across a number of government agencies. And importantly, this data is going to include uh, information on both health and crime related outcomes. And so I have access to Medicaid claims data that allow me to identify individuals with diagnosed mental illness. And I also have data from law enforcement agencies that helps me measure any contact that these men have with the criminal justice system. And so I'll go into the research design a little more, but what you should have in mind is that the way that I will study this question is by leveraging a break in Medicaid coverage that happens when individuals age out of Medicaid eligibility when they turn 19. And I do want to point out very briefly that Medicaid is, is a very relevant policy to think about in this context, not only because it's the provider of health care for most low income Americans, but it, it is also the largest payer of behavioral health services in the US. And so in terms of thinking about access to mental health care, Medicaid is a very important policy. So now let, let me give you a little bit of background about the data. Uh, let me just start off by just talking about why it might be the case that losing access to insurance might affect criminal behavior. And so I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but I just basically want to talk about the fact that losing access to Medicaid means losing access to services. And so that can just have a, a wide array of effects on the individuals that were relying on Medicaid for these services, whether that's medication or access to, uh, for example, social workers, uh, or any of the other services that Medicaid provides. And so I've included here a number of things, a number of channels that might be underlying this relationship. And so one example is that if individuals are relying on Medicaid for access to medications or other resources, and they lose access to these services, then that might disrupt their educational attainment, that might make it more difficult to find or to keep a job, and that might make criminal activities more appealing. So that's just something that you can have in the back of your head as we talk about this relationship between Medicaid coverage and criminal involvement. The, the data, to give you a little bit more of a sense of uh, what it's going to have and, and the data that I use, it's going to be data for a disproportionately low income sample of adolescents in South Carolina. And for those of you that are less familiar with the state, it's a relatively low income state with low levels of health insurance coverage. And the data that I have is going to include these insurance claims, as I mentioned, which allow me to see all visits to doctors and hospitals, as well as all pharmacy claims, as well as all these criminal outcomes from three different law enforcement agencies that are going to allow me to see information on all arrests, incarceration spells, and so on. And as I mentioned, it's going to be a disproportionately low income sample of adolescents, and I've included some statistics here to give you a sense of the data that I work with. So these individuals are relatively low income, three fourths of them have at some point been enrolled in Medicaid and criminal uh, contact with the criminal justice system is relatively high even in adolescents. I also want to give you a brief sense that within the sample that I'm looking at, there is a high prevalence of mental disorders that I can see through the Medicaid claims data. So I've included here some of the most common diagnoses that I see. You see that the most common one is hyperkinetic syndrome, otherwise known as ADHD. But we also see a sizable share of these individuals with other disorders. And I'm also able to see what kinds of services these individuals are using, whether that's 
um, meetings with social workers or counselors or mental health medications. So to give you a sense of what I do to study this question, I'm going to uh, use the fact that individuals have access to coverage, uh, Medicaid coverage between the ages of zero to 18, but then they age out of this eligibility when they turn 19. And so there are some exceptions for individuals who are allowed to stay on past 19, but for the most part, childless adults in South Carolina and in many other states in the South have very limited access to Medicaid services past 19. And so, uh, the spirit of the analysis is that I'm going to look at individuals who were enrolled in Medicaid right before 19 and who lose access to this coverage, and I'm going to compare them to individuals that were not enrolled right before 19, but who resemble these other individuals along other observable characteristics. And so I'm going to compare their likelihood of incarceration before and after 19 to see whether those that were affected by this loss in coverage seem to be more likely to be arrested and incarcerated after losing access to insurance. So I've included here a few more details, but for the sake of time, I won't go too much into it, but I basically assign individuals to these treatment and comparison groups, and then just look at their outcomes before and after 19. So um, as I said, I'll assign them uh, a little bit earlier so that I can study whether the two groups look similar in the pre-period in this moment of time before 19. And then if I see any divergence in outcomes that starts right at age 19, then I can attribute that difference to the loss in Medicaid eligibility. Okay, so here I'm showing you some of the results. On the left-hand side, I'm just plotting the raw data, the raw means of the data. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing you this difference in differences that I mentioned, looking at the differences between the two groups before and after 19. And so we see that the two groups look relatively similar before 19, but then they begin to diverge from each other so that the individuals who lost access to Medicaid are more likely to be incarcerated after 19. And if I look at whether an individual has ever been incarcerated, I find a similar result and I see that this increase is coming from new individuals being incarcerated for the first time. So having their first serious criminal justice contact after losing Medicaid eligibility. And so the question here is, is this all about just losing Medicaid or is it perhaps specific to losing access to Medicaid's behavioral health services? And so what I do next is I look specifically within these two groups at individuals with and without mental health histories to see whether the effect is being driven by one of the two groups. And when I do that, and you can look here at the right-hand side, I find that individuals who lost Medicaid coverage but did not have a mental health history, they continue to look exactly like their comparison group after uh, age 19, whereas the individuals who had mental health histories, they're completely driving the effect. This increase in incarceration that I see is entirely driven by these individuals. Um, I also wanted to show you that the, when I look specifically at violent offenses, this is one of the category of offenses that does seem to increase when these individuals lose access to these services. And then finally, the last result I want to show you is, well, I've shown you that individuals with mental health histories seem to be more likely to be incarcerated after losing access to insurance, but is it something about losing access to medications, for example? What is it about these behavioral health services? And so if I focus only on individuals who were relying on Medicaid for uh, mental health medications, I find that the effect is more pronounced for these individuals denoted here in purple. And so it seems to be the case that individuals uh, rely heavily on Medicaid for these medications and losing access to these medications is quite important. And I do see that this increase in violent crime specifically is also uh, more pronounced for individuals relying on medications. So just to summarize what I've shown you since I'm running out of time, um, in this paper, I look at the impact of losing Medicaid eligibility on low income and likelihood of incarceration. And I find that men with mental health histories who lose access to Medicaid, they're more likely to be incarcerated and that the effects are more pronounced for those relying on Medicaid for medications. In the paper, I also do a cost benefit analysis, thinking about Medicaid eligibility as a policy and how it compares to other policies. Uh, and I find that it's a relatively cost effective policy for every dollar spent on Medicaid, society recoups around $2 in associated benefits. So to conclude, just thinking about what the takeaways and the policy implications of this paper are, one natural uh, implication is that policymakers might consider improving access to mental health care as one way to reduce uh, crime and also lower criminal justice expenditures. And to the extent that mental health care might complement other uh, policies that are already in place, for example, uh, some more traditional policies like um, 
uh, hiring police officers or longer sentence lengths to the extent that individuals are more able to uh, reduce errors in judgment or decision making when they have access to mental health care, then we might even see mental health care as a complementary policy as opposed to a substitute for other policies. Finally, uh, if expanding Medicaid is not feasible, then I did want to mention that there are other policy alternatives that are uh, sort of natural implications of this research. Uh, one potential alternative is expanding coverage just for individuals with mental health diagnoses or that are using behavioral health services, or perhaps even having limited benefit programs that don't have full insurance coverage, but only cover behavioral health services. And then finally, for um, states that have already expanded Medicaid, other alternatives include ensuring that there are sufficient providers of mental health services in certain areas, this might not be the case. And so making sure that adults and low income young adults have access to these services seems to be quite important given the findings here. And then finally, and I'll just conclude by saying that, of course, I've studied Medicaid here as one very relevant policy to consider, but of course, providing access to affordable behavioral health services through alternative agencies or means is also another uh, implication to take away. So I'll pause here. Thank you so much.